bright up here. It's like brighter than being outside <laughs> on the lights because they film everything. So everything's blurry. Maybe I'm aging and uh, you know, that's really what it is. Hopefully it's just the lighting. Uh, hi, I'm Robert Lang. I'm director of Brookings Mountain West and greetings. Welcome to UNLV and to Greenspun Hall. And even though Brian Greenspun told me he didn't want me to call him out, there's our benefactor, Brian Greenspun. And uh, welcome to a fun day of politics. Uh, if you're here, you like politics. So, you know, we can be unabashed in discussing uh, where the state, the nation, where the region is. And I also want to provide just a bit of context for what today is and where it came from and what this project is in the longer term sense. There is a book published by the Brookings Institution Press called Red, Blue, Purple America. And it's about the really election, 2008 election, the demographics leading up to the 2008 election. And it was a project that many of the participants in today's event were involved with back in Washington, D.C. And it was a successful book. We had a lot of fun with the project. Uh, we developed a lot of baseline figures for where the country's demography was going and how that connected to its politics. Uh, it's part of the structural background noise in American politics that, you know, despite the switch in each election, there's a sort of new you know, big picture, a new big issue on the table like there is right now in, in terms of the recession. There's also this change in the country as a whole. And it's, a, it's somewhat apart from politics, but it's also influencing politics. It's also part of public policy. And so the book was a kind of sober, middle of the road, nonpartisan look at just where the country was on all these baseline figures about growth, about metropolitan change, and so on. And so it started as a national look. And one of the findings of the, the book was that there are certain swing regions in the United States. There are certain reliably Democratic regions, like, for example, New England and Northeast. There's reliably Republican regions, such as the Southeast. And the great original swing region of the country was, of course, the Midwest. You know, all roads led to Ohio. Everybody wanted to win Ohio. John Kerry lost his election, basically, in Ohio. But over the course of this decade, the last decade, the West, which used to be pretty reliably Republican, emerged, the Mountain West, especially the Southern Mountain West, emerged as a swing region. And in fact, three states swung to the Democrats in the 2008 election. In fact, the Democrats held their convention in Denver on purpose. It wasn't, you know, when they pick a convention site, they don't just, you know, do it at random. They, uh, you know, of course, they're looking for hotels and things like that, but they're also looking to send a message and send a signal. And going to Denver was a signal that the, de that the Democrats thought that the Mountain West was competitive. They were right, it was competitive. Uh, and it may not remain competitive in this election, perhaps, but if you look at the demographic change in the Mountain West, the fact that it's urban, that it's diversifying, these are the kinds of changes that typically signal a shift to more democratic politics. They don't have to. It's not that any party has a lock on any particular ethnic group. You know, just look at the history of Republican Party and African Americans. They're responsible for the 14th Amendment. Fast forward, they want to repeal the 14th Amendment, you know, 120 years later or so. So it's not that uh, anything's fixed in stone. Demography is not destiny. It's that given these current trends, given this current structure of politics, this seems to be the likely outcome of the next several elections. That in time, something like Texas is a swing state because there's enough growth in the Hisp Hispanic population. And that, you know, even in this last election, when George Bush went home to Dallas County, Obama won the county. And his father's living in Harris County, Obama won the county. Metropolitan Atlanta voted for Obama. The rest of the state didn't. You know, the, the balance of power in a lot of these states is that there still remains enough non-metro, firmly Republican vote that the state itself ends up being a Republican state in the Electoral College or it sends U.S. Senators or Governors that are Republicans. But we began to see the contours of this change. And I'll show some of that in my work, and I know Rui and, and Bill have a lot to say on this topic as well. And then, again, the point is trajectory, not inevitability. The point is this is the pattern as it's setting up. This is the movement and direction that we're going in, but it's not that any of us regard any election as any form of inevitability. 
because there are events concurrent with an election that can turn that election around. People can come out and vote uh, in numbers that they didn't vote in previous elections and change the mix in any one election, like midterm elections especially, have, tend to have an older and wider population vote in them, just before you even get to the current politics. There's always a, you know, a pattern that the bigger elections, the presidential elections, have a greater diversity of voter and have a larger amount of voters, sometimes double the amount of voters. Uh, and I just have some housekeeping duties and I want to turn quickly to the panels themselves. So uh, let me say also that we're not going to spend a lot of time introducing folks. It's in your packet if you want to read up on them. Uh, so we'll just identify who they are and then, and then move on. All that with the purpose of just getting to the material as quickly as possible. And we also have a lunch program and I have some housekeeping just to remind you. Lunch is not here. We're walking over to the student center. There'll be a folks with red shirts on, we're going to follow them over, no one gets lost in the parking lot over here, <laughs> wanders out on the Maryland Parkway, walks across the street, whatever. Uh, we want to make sure you all gather with us. And that we're going to also, late in the day, roll out a survey that's part of this project. And the survey was an effort to get at the bigger currents within the Intermountain West, the public attitudes on a series of issues, education, environment, to see where this region is. So the poll, and the survey rather, comes out today. It's on the website already. Uh, it has some interesting findings, I think. It dovetails with some of the recent polling that I've seen the Review Journal actually do, where there is, for example, you know, happily in the case of this institution, a great deal of public investment and uh, willingness to, sh you know, to provide resources to the universities. And you see that actually in a lot of the surveying. Uh, that education is a very high priority in the country right now. It's really second after the economy. There's a sense that, you know, it is broken in many places. And there is a willingness to try to engage the public sphere and try to fix these things. Uh, these are all positive developments, uh, I think, in terms of, you know, the, the bigger picture and where the country is heading, where the region is heading in the long term. You know, but in any one election, of course, any kind of politics uh, goes in the last few weeks out the wayside. That's the kind of careful, rational discourse that we hope to establish in a meeting like this and everything's down to ritualized chance. And I recognize that and I make no illusions as to, despite the fact that all these folks are willing to pay, maybe the politicians will wake up and find that, you know, there's a voice within them to make this case. No, I, I've seen it go the other way enough and uh, recognize in the sort of real politics of the world. That just ain't the way it works a lot. So with that, what I want to do is I guess we're going to start to move the curtains now. There's my signal to move the curtains, by the way. How's that for, you could tell. Uh, I've gone to announcing school and failed out. <laughs> Luckily, I got into the whole professor school thing and that worked for me. Uh, and our first panelists are going to come up. And I think David Damore is going to introduce them and he is our discussant. Thanks. Thank you and uh, welcome. Uh, for the morning session, we have two presentations, each of which will run about a half hour followed by some commentary and observations by myself, and then we'll open it up to you guys for questions and answers and follow up with the authors. Uh, the first of our presentations is going to sort of situate us broadly, looking at patterns of demographic and electoral change over the last uh, decade or so in the Intermountain West here. Uh, the presentation is entitled America's New Swing Region, the Political Demography and Geography of the Mountain West. Its authors are William Fry, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute, and Rui Teixeira, Visiting Fellow at Brookings, as well as a Joint Fellow at the Center for American Progress and the Century Foundation. This is also his first trip to Las Vegas. <laughs> I'm going to try to do a tag team kind of thing here, since uh, we both have different areas. Now, we need our uh, slideshow up at uh, some point. Um, are you guys controlling it? Because uh, that's not our slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you give preface to it before uh, the slideshow? Yeah, OK. They'll figure it out, no doubt. Um, OK. Um, so Bill and I are going to present findings from our uh, new paper, uh, America's New Swing Region, the Political Demography and Geography of the, uh, the Intermountain West. And um, what we try to do in this paper is take a look at the growth patterns and how they're changing the sort of politically relevant complexion, demographic complexion of the Intermountain West. And as you guys, 
I I'm sure no. I mean, this is a pretty damn fast-growing region. Four of the five fastest-growing states in the United States are in this Intermountain West region. First, Nevada. Second, Arizona. Third, Utah. And fifth, Idaho. Colorado ranks eighth in New Mexico. While it isn't in the top ten, it's still growing faster than the nation as a whole. So this is a very dynamic region, an enormously dynamic region. And when you have this kind of growth, it typically does change the demographic structure uh, of, of, a, of, a, of an area, of a region of states in, in important ways. So uh, we tried to do that in this study, is try to figure out what those ways are, see what kind of patterns we can come up with by looking at the, the data. Um, for purposes of our analysis, we divided up each state into uh, a series of regions so we could look at differential growth patterns and demographic change uh, at, at the sub-state level. Um, we looked at the structure of eligible voters in each state overall and within these regions. Um, we looked at the demographic trends in voting and how they related to these shifts. We looked at geographical shifts in voting and voting support uh, uh, in these states and within these regions. Um, and uh, in the end, we tried to make sense out of it all, and I guess you all will be the judge of if we succeeded. Um, the data sources we used were the uh, censuses up through 2000. We used the 2008 American Community Survey uh, public use microdata sample, um, and we used the exit polls from 88, 2004, 2008, uh, and uh, basically pretty much anything else we could get our hands on. Um, and I think we come up with some interesting stuff, but. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Bill Fry, and he's going to talk a little bit about some uh, key demographic segments that we've looked at in our work. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rui. And you'll soon find out that this really is a tag team match. I mean, you've heard of Rogers and Hammerstein or <laughs> Abbott and Costello. This is Teixeira and Fry. And uh, Rui's a political guy. I do a little bit with demographics, and, and somehow between us, we try to get something going. Um, we have a lot of demographic stuff on eligible voters. One of the things the American Community Survey allows us to do with the, the PUMS files, public use microfiles, is to actually tailor eligible voter populations by a whole slew of demographics. And in our report, uh, which you'll be able to get a copy of it some, uh, somewhere or somehow, uh, you will be able to see all of it. But for purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus primarily on key demographic groups that we think are really important in understanding the nature of the electorate and the changes in the electorate in each of these states and in, within key regions of these states. So those key groups are essentially uh, mutually exclusive groups. If you take the eligible voter population and break uh, one group out, we call them minorities. They're simply non-Hispanic, people who aren't non-Hispanic whites. And of course, we realize that there are different patterns for different minority groups, but this is to simplify things a little bit. And then for all of the white groups, we break them down into three categories. White working age college graduates, white working age people who haven't graduated from college, which we'll call the white working class, that Rui's written about an awful lot and will have a lot to say about, and also white seniors. So that big, uh, that big uh, 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 pie chart has all of those different groups. Here we have on this slide, the breakdown of each of the six Mountain West states on of each of these different groups. Now, the first thing that hits you in the face is two of them are pretty much white. That is, Idaho and Utah, their electorate uh, is even whiter than it is, than is their total population. And uh, so 11% of Utah and 9% of Idaho are minorities. Everybody else is some sort of whites. The, the, uh, and of course, New Mexico, we uh, actually have a very, uh, uh, a very minority uh, dominated electorate in the case of New Mexico, 51%. The other three states, or three, three other states, Arizona, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, and Nevada, rather Arizona and Nevada are second in their most minority uh, laden uh, electorate, and Colorado somewhere in between. Now this other group that we're talking about, which is the white working class, they're a big share of all of these states. You can see 57% of Idaho's electorate is the white working class. 56% uh, of Utah, uh, because New Mexico is such a minority-dominated state, only 25% is the white working class. But the other three states, uh, Arizona, Colorado, and Nevada, you know, have about 40% of their population, which is a white working class. The white working class, as we'll soon see, is a, is a diminishing part of all of these states' electorate, but still a substantial part. And as Rui will talk about, they go in different directions in different states and in different regions, and they're important to keep an eye on. 
The group that we think is really important, in addition to the minority group, are white college graduates. White college graduates are still a pretty small part or a smaller part of these states' populations in the white working class. But in the state of Colorado, even though it's not the whitest of all of these states, has the highest share of the white college graduates. About a quarter of its electorate, uh, of Colorado's electorate, are white college graduates. Uh, of course, because of their white population, Utah and Idaho have large white college graduate shares. Uh, smaller shares are in the other states, uh, Nevada, Arizona, and uh, New Mexico. So uh, keep an eye on these groups. The white elderly, uh, are, we think, are important in terms of the way they vote, the way they vote, but there tend to be a smaller share in most of these states and in most of these regions. But next January the 1st, uh, keep an eye out. The first baby boomer will turn age 65, and from then on, the white elderly will be a much bigger part of these states' electorates than they are right now. So we have them there because they're going to be big in the future. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is changes. Now, here are uh, changes in the share of these voter segments uh, for each of these states. In other words, when you look at the whole population distributed in a certain way, between 2000 and 2008, Nevada increased its minority share by 7%. It's the biggest increase in the minority share among these six states, but all of the states have increased their minority shares, especially Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, when you look at the white college graduate group, the group we say we're keeping our eye on, here again, there are changes and big change, or reasonably big changes in Utah, Idaho, Colorado, and Nevada. Not so big in Arizona and uh, actually decline in New Mexico. This doesn't mean New Mexico is losing uh, white college graduates. It just means that white college graduates in New Mexico are growing at a much slower rate than the other segments. So it looks like it's a declining share. And then finally, this is the big change that's pretty pervasive everywhere, the decline of the white working class. This used to be the bastion and still is of a lot of the political campaigns and, and lots of issues. But you can see in all of these states, and especially Nevada, there's a decline in the share of the white working class. So that's a big overview of the demographics. Now we're going to switch gears and start going into one state at a time. This is where we do our Teixeira and Fry thing. But I'm going to start out with Arizona. And this is an example of what we've done in each of the other states. We've broken Arizona up into five regions. Uh, Phoenix, which is the biggest part of Arizona, it's 66% uh, of its population. And it's the, it's the part of Phoenix we're going to focus a lot on in our discussion, or the part of Arizona we're going to focus a lot on in our discussion, but also Tucson. And then there's the north, which includes the, the Flagstaff metropolitan area, which is a relatively small share of, the, of uh, Arizona's population, only about 5%. There's the west, which is kind of a fast growing, but still a relatively small share. It includes Prescott and, U and Yuma. And then there's the southeast, which is only 4% of Arizona's population, doesn't, doesn't have any metropolitan areas. But if, if you look at this next map, you can see the growth rates. Dark green means, means fast growth. growth. Um, red means decline, and yellow means only modest growth. So you can see Phoenix, Tucson, and that west region is growing quite a bit. Well, let's look at these uh, key demographic segments for Arizona. We're just going to focus on Phoenix versus the, the entire state. And it looks a lot, Phoenix looks a lot like the rest of the state. Uh, it has a little bit more uh, white working class, that blue part of the bar, 40% versus 38%, a little bit less minorities. But uh, Phoenix is important because it does comprise 66% of the state, and it's growing more rapidly than any other part of the state by about 33% between 2000 and 2009, though the other parts of the states are important. So now I'm going to flip it to Rui. He's going to talk about the political aspects of this. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, let's take a look at the, uh, there we go. Um, look at the map from uh, 2008. Um, this shows you the uh, change in the uh, distribution of support uh, for uh, uh, McCain and for Obama. Um, blue, of course, is, uh, dark blue is the strongest support, uh, above 10-point margin. Red is uh, more than a 10-point margin for McCain. And uh, we don't have a lot of blue in our map. Uh, we got Cosonino County here in the north. Importantly, Tucson here, light blue in the south. Phoenix uh, was actually uh, all, kind of on the bubble there. It was minus 11 points um, and obviously determined a lot what happened to the state as a whole. McCain carried it by eight points. You have to wonder if McCain wasn't from Arizona, how well he actually would have done in that state. I mean, to only carry your own state by 
eight points actually wasn't so great, I think. Um, and in fact, we're going to see in the next slide uh, some of the things that, that have happened in, um, in this area uh, since 1988. There's been a lot of important changes. So basically, uh, Arizona has gone from minus 21 in the Dukakis-Bush election for the Democrats to minus 8 in the last election. And of course, it hasn't been equally distributed across the states. What this map shows you, the light green and dark green represent a shift toward the Democrats. Uh, the yellow and orange represent a shift toward the Republicans. You can see in the southeast, there's some shifts toward the uh, Republicans uh, up here in the, uh, in the west. Uh, but a lot of it, uh, a lot of the state, and of course the most important parts of the state are green, representing a shift toward the Democrats. The most important of all these shifts, of course, by a wide margin, is this one right here. That's Maricopa County, a 19-point shift toward the Democrats since the 1988 election. This is, uh, you know, 64, 66 percent of the vote in a typical election. And as Bill was pointing out, this is by far the fastest growing part of Arizona. So not only is it a moose in terms of size, it's a really fast growing moose. Uh, it grew by 33 uh, percent between 2000 and 2009. So the fact that you have the biggest shift toward the Democrats over this time period in the biggest, fastest growing area of the state, where as Bill was pointing out, you see these shifts in demographic segments happening fairly quickly. There's about half a point, percentage point a year decline in the white working class uh, is of tremendous significance. Um, now, of course, that's not going to have a huge impact on the results in the 2010 election. This is a terrible environment for the Democrats, a great environment for the Republicans. They have a chance of taking back some House seats, the GOP. I don't think uh, McCain or Brewer as the Senate and gubernatorial candidates for the GOP are going to have any trouble at all in this state. But come 2012, when we have a, you know, a, a sort of a new, a, a sort of a more diverse electorate, as Rob was pointing out, that's going to be coming to the polls. Uh, it could be a somewhat better kind of uh, atmosphere for the Democrats if the economy improves. And I think we'll have four more years relative to 2008 of the kinds of demographic changes uh, that, are, that are tending to move uh, uh, Arizona in a more liberal direction. You'll have more minorities. You'll have, again, that half a percentage point decline, another, uh, so another two or three points less for the white working class. And you'll have more members of the millennial generation, which we're going to hear a lot more about later, but are more liberal than the rest of the population. So come 2012, we'll see if these trends that we see here continue. That's going to determine how close Arizona is in the 2012 election, particularly, of course, Maricopa County. If it continues its pretty steady move toward the Democrats uh, evidenced in the 2012 election, it could be a very close election uh, uh, in, in this state. Um, so that's all for Arizona for now. And now we, we mustn't tarry. We have to go on to another state. <laughs> Okay, we're moving to Colorado now, and uh, we've broken up Colorado actually into eight regions, um, and three of them are actually the metropolitan area of Denver, which as a metropolitan area comprises about 51% of the state's population. It's pretty important. But because there's a lot of discussion about what's going on between the city and the suburbs, and the city and the inner suburbs and the outer suburbs, nationally, a lot of people look at Denver as kind of a uh, the bellwether for this kind of shift. Uh, in other words, typically Republicans carry the outer suburbs, Democrats carry the city and the inner suburbs. Where is that dividing line? Uh, we decided to carve up the Denver metropolitan area in that respect. And uh, the very fastest growing region of our eight are the outer suburbs of Denver. Uh, it's only a small share of the state's population, uh, but it's growing by about 48 uh, percent, and so it's very important. We also look at uh, Boulder, and Colorado Springs, uh, Boulder only about 8% of the state's population, and uh, I think that's right, 6% uh, of the state's population. Colorado Springs, uh, another big metropolitan area, but only about 13% of the state's population. Uh, neither are growing as rapidly as Denver or the, the outer suburbs of Denver, for sure, although they're growing at a fairly brisk pace. Then we have this eastern uh, block of, uh, of a region uh, with only one small metropolitan area, Pueblo. It's a relatively small share of the state's population, only about 7%, 7 and it's growing very minimally. And, and I'll show you the next slide to show pieces of it are actually declining. And then a very small part of the state that doesn't have a metropolitan area, the central and southeast. And then a fairly significant, uh, although not nearly significant as Denver, uh, uh, is that north and west, which, include, which contains rapidly growing metropolitan areas like Fort Collins and Greeley as well as some declining areas. The next slide shows uh, the kind of growth 
pattern. Clearly, Denver is, uh, is doing quite well, especially the outer suburbs with their dark green and light green, and then up to, uh, to the north from the Denver metropolitan area. But that whole east area is, uh, is declining in population. Uh, many of the counties there, and uh, that's important to take note of. If we look at uh, here for Denver, uh, instead of looking at Denver as a whole, we did break out the three regions of Denver in terms of our key demographic characteristics. Now, the inner suburbs look a lot like the whole state of Colorado. That, that second bar looks about the same as the fourth bar. It doesn't differ all that much. And remember, Colorado still has a very relatively high percentage of white college graduates, 26% in uh, the state, 24% for the inner suburbs. But the city of Denver and the outer suburbs look quite different from the state as a whole. The city of Denver has 34% of its electorate minorities and 30% um, the white college graduates. So it really is a very significant area. These are typically groups that probably will favor Democrats, but Rui will talk more about that. And the outer suburbs, although it has a very low minority uh, share of the electorate, has 40%, uh, a full 40% of its electorate white college graduates, and that's very important. If we look at the changes over time between 2000 and 2008, now the four bars in each cluster show the gains or declines of minorities, of white seniors, of the white uh, college graduates, and the white working class. All three parts of the Denver metropolitan area are showing declines in their white working class, especially the inner suburbs. All three parts of the Denver metropolitan area are showing gains in their shares of minorities, but especially the inner suburbs. So the inner suburbs, even though they kind of look like the rest of the state, are undergoing this kind of dynamic change, as well as some of the outer suburbs as well. So uh, a, a key to the uh, Colorado politics, we think, is, is focusing a lot on Denver. And with that, I'll bring Rui back. OK. Um, so let's take a look then at the uh, 2008 map. Um, as you can see, uh, the blue is pretty much concentrated in the center here. Um, some fairly thinly populated counties in the central and southeast. But uh, the key for Obama's seven-point victory was, of course, Denver itself, which I believe he carried by 52 points. He carried the Denver inner suburbs as a whole, Jefferson, uh, Arapahoe, and Adams by uh, 13 points, I believe. Um, he carried Boulder by... Did I say that? 46 points. And he carried Fort Collins Metro here, which is about as big as Boulder. So um, the key to the victory, then, is, is, is winning in these, uh, the center part, uh, uh, the north center part of, uh, of Colorado, uh, again, where a lot of these uh, demographic changes have been biting, um, though in different ways in the inner suburbs than in Denver. And as we'll see, actually, there's some important changes taking place uh, in the outer suburbs as well. But that's a little bit easier to see in the next slide, which shows you the shift from the uh, minus eight Dukakis uh, election for the Democrats in 1988 to the plus seven victory for Obama in 2008. And as you can see, a lot of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the map is green. We do see in this uh, east region where uh, you know, there's so, been so much population decline. Uh, the good news for the Republicans is they actually have been gaining in that area. The bad news is fewer people live there relative to the state as a whole, so that's not so great. Um, in this uh, area, 51% of, uh, of the uh, vote about in, in Colorado is in the Denver outer suburbs, inner suburbs, and Denver City itself. Um, and we've seen big shifts toward the uh, Democrats over that time period. Um, there's been, I believe, yeah, a 29-point shift in Denver City, a 25-point shift in the Denver inner suburbs, and even a 22-point shift in Colorado Springs, which, as you know, is quite conservative. And even, very interesting, this is Douglas County here, which is like six, grew 60% in this decade. But as it's grown uh, by, by such a, a, a rapid amount, it's actually tended to shift toward the Democrats. That area has become more diverse, more educated. It's a little bit different than it used to be. So even though there's the, Denver, the Democrats are still getting killed in the Denver outer suburbs, they're getting killed by a lot less, which actually <laughs> counts. So um, that's important. Up here in, uh, in, in the Fort Collins metro, the Democrats have also had a 15-point shift. And as you saw on the previous slide, they actually carried uh, Larimer County there, the Fort Collins Metro. So a lot of important changes going on in Colorado. What's going to happen in the future? Well, I'm not a swami, and I certainly can't, uh, I can't predict Buck Bennett, which is like a, a really a dogfight of a race. So at this point, Buck looks like he might have the upper hand. I think if he does prevail 
It's going to be uh, a lot of the action, again, is going to happen in this area. Is he going to push back that Democratic margin in the Denver inner suburbs from uh, double digits, which is what, what it was in 2008, back towards something approaching break even? If he can do that, I think he's got a good uh, chance of taking the state, uh, push uh, Fort Collins Metro back, uh, back toward the Republicans, where it, where it had been historically, and so on. I think all these things are possible. We'll see if he manages to do it. Uh, more long term, I think the key uh, for the contestation between the parties, I mean, we're, we're going to see this continuation of this increase in white college graduates, increase in minorities, and a decline of the white working class. You know, on balance, that should favor the Democrats. However, one thing that's really hurt the Republicans a lot in the state is not just more white college graduates, but white college graduates are much more sympathetic to the Democrats. In the 2008 election, white college graduates supported Obama by 14 points. That's a big shift from the way Colorado white college graduates used to vote. So a big issue for the Republicans is can they push that back in the other direction? We know there are going to be more of these voters. We know they're going to be more important. Is there at least a possibility there that the Republicans can push that trend back at least toward the break-even point? I mean, their, the success they're going to have with minorities, I'd say, and Hispanics probably kind of questionable at this point, but white college graduates might be a more uh, fruitful path for them. And again, 2012, you know, different turnout patterns, different kind of electorate, four more years of demographic change. I think um, the Republicans are going to have their work cut out for them, uh, but that's by no means clear they can't do it. But I think those are the areas and those are the groups they're going to have to concentrate on. Okay, we move to Idaho, and uh, Idaho is uh, quite different than the states that we've been talking about. It is a, a rapidly growing state, um, but it is a, a largely white state. We have uh, identified three, just three regions in, uh, in Idaho, the Boise metropolitan area. 40% uh, of uh, the state's population resides there, but it is the most rapidly growing part of the state. Uh, we uh, cut off a few, few uh, counties uh, up in the Panhandle. Uh, about 20% of the population live up there with a few smaller metro areas in it. And then in the uh, south, uh, we had uh, uh, another 40% of the state's population, but not growing as rapidly as a region as the Boise metropolitan area, but the two, one of the two metro areas, Idaho Falls, is growing. You can see from uh, the population growth map here, uh, Boise doing well. Idaho Falls doing well, but some, uh, some declines in some of those other regions. Uh, looking at the key demographic uh, segments for uh, Idaho and for the Boise metropolitan area, Boise uh, is a little more, and has, a, has a greater representation of white college graduates, 23% compared to 18% for the state as a whole, uh, and a lower percentage of white uh, working class, but still fairly dominated by the white working class, and, and uh, that's important to notice. But like some of the other states we were looking at and some of the other metropolitan areas we were looking at, uh, Boise Metro as the state is uh, showing a substantial decline in its share of the white working class from, since 2000, a gain in uh, white college graduates and a gain in minorities, all uh, segments that are, you know, per perhaps some changes in the demographics that might vote, uh, vote differently for uh, politics, which we will talk about. Okay, Rob tells me we've got to pick it up here, so I'll just talk fast. That'll help. Um, all right, well, let's take a look at uh, what's going on here in Idaho. Uh, not a lot of blue in this, uh, in this uh, state, as you might think. Um, the uh, Democrats lost it by uh, 25 points, so not much of a squeaker there. We've got Blaine County here. We've got Teton County here. And up here, we have the appropriately, uh, this is Lata County, which is, I think this is very significant, the Moscow micropolitan area. Need I, need I say more? No wonder those guys vote a little bit differently, huh? So uh, um, is there going to be much change in Idaho in the future? Has there been much change in the past? Let's look at that first. Well, um, this shows the uh, change over the 1988 to 2008 uh, time period. And uh, actually, um, it went for, I believe, from uh, minus 25 to minus 26, or maybe it was the other way around. Basically, no change in the the distribution of the presidential vote overall in Idaho. But as you can see, there have been some uh, differentiation in, in what happened here. Moscow, is, as we might think, has become a little bit more democratic. Uh, Blaine County, uh, out here in the Wyoming border, a little bit more. And this is Ada County here. That's the most important part of the change. Uh, Ada County, um, let's see here, yeah, moved toward the Democrats by 22 points. 
and the Boise metro as a whole, because of Ada County basically, moved toward the Democrats by 14 points. Well, if Boise is like, what, it's like 40% uh, of, uh, of, the, of the state, and if they move toward the Democrats by 14 points, why didn't the state become much more democratic? Well, the answer is up here in the panhandle. The panhandle actually has moved away from the Democrats and toward the Republicans by 18 points. If you look at a 1988 map, there's actually a scattering of blue counties up here in 88. They've all disappeared. The panhandle has become markedly more conservative. So even though you have you know, some pop growth in uh, Boise area, and even though it's moved toward the Democrats, uh, it's been uh, adequately counterbalanced by this pretty significant uh, Republican shift in the panhandle area. So what's the prognosis for um, uh, uh, politically going forward, 2010? Uh, not going to be any squeakers there either. In 2012, we'll see if some of these demographics, particularly in the Boise area, continue that trend there, again, particularly in Ada County, and see if it can start uh, moving the state a little bit back toward a more competitive situation. Uh, just one thing that would obviously make a difference is that the pro-GOP trend in the panhandle stopped because at this point, as I say, they're counterbalancing them. But uh, I guess the bottom line here is this isn't one you're going to stay up late <laughs> in 2012 worrying about. Well, I don't know if we can cover all the states, but we should certainly cover Nevada. And, uh, we should do New Mexico. It's important. Well, we okay. have enough time. We have enough time? Yeah, yeah. We have enough time? You've got half we have enough time. All right. Yeah, yeah. We'll do that. We just can't. <laughs> you actually can't talk. Okay. All right. Here's, um, here's, uh, here's New Mexico. And uh, New Mexico, we have three regions in as well. We have, uh, we have uh, Albuquerque, which is uh, uh, the largest percentage of the state. It's 43% uh, of the state's population. And we have a northwest region, which is, um, yeah, has two metropolitan areas, but one significant one is Santa Fe, which is growing in population. And uh, then the south and northeast, which is not, it's the whole rest of the state, and it's not growing very rapidly at all, except for Las Cruces, uh, which is growing fairly, uh, fairly uh, sharply. And you can see uh, there's decline in New Mexico and a lot, of par a lot of part of New Mexico. It actually ranks 47th among states, no, sorry, 17th among states in uh, population growth, uh, not in the top five like the other uh, Mountain West states. So it's not, it's not as rapidly growing of an area. But you can see the fast growth in the Albuquerque metropolitan area and some growth in Santa Fe and in Las Cruces. As to the uh, demographic segments, um, of course, minorities are a big part of the electorate in, uh, in New Mexico, 49% uh, of the Albuquerque metro. But compared to the state, it has a higher share of the white college graduates, about the same share of the white working class. And more recently, uh, it saw, it's shown some of the similar tendencies in other places, even larger gains in minorities, even larger gains in the, in the white working class. There is a decline, however, in the white uh, college graduate share, not in, the per, not in the actual number, but in the share, and that has to do with the, the, the more rapid growth of, of the minority population than in the other, in the other segments. So, uh, Rui? Okay, we're moving right along here. Hold on to your hats. Okay, so this is the uh, 88 map. As you can see, the Democrats do quite well, and that's pretty important right there. It's a little bit hard to see them. That's Bernalillo County in Albuquerque, the central county of the Albuquerque metro. The Democrats carried the, um, uh, that area as a whole, the, uh, the metro, by 33 points. They also carried this northwest region where Taos and Santa Fe and all the hippies are by about, plus a lot of Native Americans. It's a lethal combination for Republicans um, by 18 points. As you can see, there's a lot of red in the rest of the state, but uh, it didn't really counterbalance these significant uh, pro-democratic margin. So it's a very easy uh, victory for Obama. He carried the, uh, the state by 15 points. Um, and now looking at the, uh, the shift since, uh, since 1988, um, here we have, uh, you see there's a lot of green in the map, a lot of green in the map. Uh, only really on the edges here do you have any moves toward the Republicans. Again, the most important shifts are going to be right here in the Albuquerque metro. Um, there was, I believe it was a 30-point shift in Bernalillo County, 26-point shift in the Albuquerque metro as a whole, and in the northwest, you had a, in this area here, you had a 20-point shift for the Democrats. So um, what's going to happen in New Mexico in, in the future? I think a lot of it's going to depend on, we know the minority population is going to continue to increase. That's the really uh, significant thing. We know that the white college graduates and the white working class are going to decline. White college graduates are it's another state where they move pretty heavily toward the Democrats. Obama split white college graduates evenly, 49-49, in the uh, 2008 election. So if that continues in 2012 with the continuing growth of minority population, uh, that's going to make that state uh, kind of hard to 
to, get, to grab for the Republicans. And remember, they got to come back from a 15-point uh, deficit in, in 2008. So uh, this is a state where the, really the, the, the action is all about the increased minority population. As Bill was pointing out earlier, the, the, uh, the share of the white college graduates is, is about flat, but they're still an important, uh, important part of the mix. And we'll see what happens in, in 2012. And we could dwell on that, but we won't, because we've got to keep going. <laughs> All right, now to Nevada. Now uh, to Nevada. And we'll, we'll dwell on this one. Yeah. <laughs> well, although the regional breakdown is fairly simple, as you can see here. We have Las Vegas. Why is that the hard We're the Yeah, OK. Yeah, but it would sound weird to call Las Vegas the yeah. uh, Las Vegas, Reno, and, and uh, the rural heartland. But of course, Las Vegas is 72% of the population. And uh, by far the fastest growth uh, of, uh, of the other regions in the state. And, um, you can see that from looking at this. There is uh, Nye County, which is technically part of our heartland, but really an exurb of, of Las Vegas is growing pretty rapidly too. Uh, but the rest of the heartland pretty much is not doing too well. Well, the demographic segments, uh, minorities have gained a lot uh, and is in, in Las Vegas higher than the rest of the state uh, and a somewhat fewer white working class, but it's the dynamics of growth. Even though, ne even though Nevada and Las Vegas have showed a slowdown in growth, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, you know, over the course of the decade, it's still the second fastest growing, it's, uh, it's still the fastest growing state in, in uh, the nation, and uh, it shows very broad shifts in its minority population in terms of the segment of the electorate, uh, gains and declines in the white working class. And uh, that continued churning is gonna continue to occur, and most dramatically we see here in Las Vegas compared to the state as a whole. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Nevada. Let's move on to this uh, slide here. Well, you know, if you looked at this and you didn't know anything about the population distribution in, in, uh, in Nevada, you'd think, geez, you know, what a great state for John McCain. But the problem is, like, you know, not too many people live there in that immense sea of red counties in, in the middle. Uh, you've got Las Vegas, which is, what, 72% of the population? And uh, what's Reno about? 12, right. So, you know, you talk about 85% of the population is in these two metros, and you've got only 15% in this area here. So that's why uh, Obama could carry the, uh, uh, the state by 12 points despite this, this sea of red in the middle, which he lost by 19 points, but he carried Clark County, Las Vegas by 19 points. He carried Reno by 12 points. You put all that together, it's a pretty easy victory uh, for, for Obama. Um, now let's look at how things have shifted over time, and that's kind of interesting. Um, this used to be a pretty, I mean, if you looked at a 1988 map uh, where Dukakis lost the state by 21 points, all you'd see is red, a dark red. Every state, every county in Nevada was carried by 10 points or more by the Republicans in, uh, in 1988. Things have changed a lot since then. Even in the rural heartland, we see some shifts toward the Democrats. It's particularly important here. But um, in these two metros, you see big, big shifts. There's a 35-point shift in Las Vegas toward the Democrats, a 35-point shift in Reno uh, toward the Democrats. I mean, what more do you need to know? Um, so is this going to continue in the future? Well, here is an example, I think, where demographics really do tell you a lot about, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but in a state where the white working class is declining by a percentage point a year, and minorities are increasing by almost a percentage point a year, and, and there's, uh, there's some white college graduates too, but this is like an, uh, a sort of replacement in the electorate kind of phenomenon. You're basically trading white working class voters for minority voters. That has a pretty clear, pretty definite, and pretty inescapable political implication. So uh, we'll see if Harry Reid is able to, you know, surf what's left of those demographics in the 2010 election. Everything's all mixed up here, and the electorate's going to look a lot different in 2010 than it did in 2008. But once we get back to 2012, I think things will uh, look a lot, be a lot different than they do now, uh, though it's certainly possible, as we know, that Reid might lose. But I think looking, taking the long term, and that's what we try to do in this, look at the long term, look at about shifts that are changing the complexion of these states. It's hard to look at these trends and think, this is, this is a state that is really significantly changing its political culture over time. And I think our last one is uh, Nevada. Utah. I mean, Nevada. Utah. We did Nevada. We, Utah. There's Utah. Utah. Yes. Utah. So that's, that's quick. <laughs> we could do this one quick. All right. So uh, we have basically three, three regions of Utah. Salt Lake, uh, the biggest region, and uh, um, it's uh, uh, 
about 37 percent of the population. Then we have a, uh, another region that kind of goes to the north and to the east uh, called the Ogden area in east, it includes the Ogden and Logan metropolitan areas, and then uh, Provo and south. So uh, it's essentially uh, carving the state up in uh, three different regions. Uh, and in fact, uh, all of those regions are growing pretty rapidly. In fact, it's the Provo and south region that's growing most rapidly in the state. But we do keep our eye on, uh, you can see the growth rates of uh, different, of course, the counties don't represent the sizes of the population, but you see the, a, a high level of growth in, around, uh, around Salt Lake and in the south in the southwest. Uh, you know, a largely white state uh, like Idaho, uh, although Salt Lake is more minor has a higher minority uh, share than the state as a whole, and has a higher white college graduate share than the state as a, state as a whole. And is a, the state as a whole has a significant white college graduate share, as does, uh, as does Salt Lake, which uh, may mean something in the future. And uh, the white working class, however, is still a relatively sharp, a large part of the state. Over time, uh, both Salt Lake and, to a lesser extent, the state as a whole are losing white working class, are gaining minorities, and more importantly, really making big increases in the white college graduates. So we see in a state that's growing quite rapidly this uh, demographic shift going on, especially being focused on the Salt Lake Metro. Well, there may be a lot of demographic change going on in Utah, but it hasn't had a lot of effect yet. I mean, this is the, uh, this is the Utah map for 2008. You know, we see Salt Lake City there, uh, where, which I think uh, Obama carried by a point, Salt Lake County. Um, the rest of it is pretty much a sea of red. Provo and South, very important. Obama lost the Provo and South region by 57 points. This is like a, this is a pretty different kind of thing than, than the Salt Lake Metro, especially Salt Lake City. Um, actually, Provo was the worst metro for Obama in the United States that had a quarter million or more in population, or the recently sized metro. So, and he lost the Ogden area in East uh, area by about 40 points. So, uh, yeah, so stuff is happening in Salt Lake that's, that's fairly good for the Democrats, but clearly it hasn't had much of an effect yet. So what's happened over time? We actually do see some shifts toward the Democrats over time, particularly in Salt Lake. That's by far the most important. Um, but again, uh, you know, we see these shifts in the other direction in Provo and South, which is really fast growing. This is a very fast growing state, but Provo and South region is really fast growing. So you have a Republican shifting Provo area, uh, that's more than count that's added, more than ad sort of adequately counterbalancing the moves in Salt Lake, where there has been a significant shift for the Democrats. Political culture is really changing. So um, the key to Utah over time, it's moved, you know, five or six points in the Democrat direction since 1988, but that's gone from super conservative to just a little bit less than super conservative. So uh, not much change. It's going to take maybe, you know, give it another 50 years, and Utah might look a little bit different. But, but so far, those demographic changes haven't really bitten that much. And, and again, this is not one you'll stay up late on uh, Election Day in 2012 uh, worrying about. So. I think that's about it. I think the, the patterns are clear, this pattern of demographic change, significantly changing the political culture in all kinds of interesting ways. But I won't say anything more about it because we've got to discuss it. <laughs> We're a little uh, pressed for time, so I'll cut my comments short so we'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, the presentation I made is in many ways sort of the tip of the iceberg of all the data analysis that's included in this paper. So if you're, it's kind of a compendium of what's occurred in this region the last 20 years. So if you're interested in this type of stuff, I suggest you get your hands on the paper here. They also have predictions for 2010 and 2012 in there, so we'll be able to see how those pan out over the next uh, month and then in two years here. The thing that strikes me most of this uh, analysis here is that the sort of red state, blue state, rural urban paradigm that sort of dominated our understanding of elections plays out in this region almost on steroids. Um, and so a reliably Republican region 20 years ago is now purple with obviously the exceptions of Idaho and, and Utah uh, where it looks like it's going to be a little slower going there. And you clearly see the importance of the suburbs in terms of the balance of power here. And this is something our next presentation will deal with in great detail here. But of course the suburbs are not monolithic here. There's going to be clear differences between the inner and outer suburbs here. Um, the bottom line I took away from the, uh, from the presentation of the paper is that there's a, clearly there's a demographic ticking time bomb here for the, for the Republican Party. As this region becomes more ethnically diverse, becomes better educated, um, the millenniums tend to uh, get into the job market and participate in politics more broadly. It spells a lot of trouble for the Republican Party given their present trajectory. 
and given their strategy, particularly on an issue like immigration here. And you can certainly see potential backlash, as we saw in California in the 1990s in response to Proposition 19, uh, 187 here. And so that, I think, is, the, is the, real, the real interesting question is here, how is the Republican Party going to adapt their rhetoric to what is going to be the swing state, the swing region that is likely to uh, dictate election outcomes here in the coming uh, decades here. So with that, those thoughts in mind, we have a few minutes for questions, and I will turn it over to the audience if anybody has any questions for Fry and Teixeira. <coughs> comparing Republican versus Democrat voting, but people are really voting for candidates there. So I'm wondering why you chose 1988 as a comparison here, and, and how do you think that uh, a change in that, that selection would have changed your outcome? Well, we, I thought, uh, we picked 1988 because it's sort of like the last election of the, uh, the Reagan era, um, when uh, before the country started shifting in a somewhat different political direction. It also gives you a pretty long time period over which to, uh, to look at change. Um, if you chose another election, I mean, you, I mean, you chose 84, you'd see bigger changes. If you chose, you know, 92, you'd see smaller changes. If you chose 2000, you'd see smaller. I mean, the, the pattern would be the same. The magnitude would be somewhat different. But what, looking over this time period, I think both makes political uh, a sort of substantive sense, and it allows you to see, uh, you know, sort of look at it in a big enough canvas. And I do think the country, I mean, uh, from other work I've done and a lot of people, I mean, 1988 is kind of a transition point for the end of one type of politics and the beginning of the new. So we're kind of doing a little checkup here to see how, in fact, we, when we originally did this analysis, we used 2004 as the end point because 2008 hadn't happened yet. And it's pretty consistent with what we show here, very consistent. What would be the role of the independent in this? For example, in Arizona, where we're from, uh, independent registration is outpacing Republican or Democrat, Democrat registration five to one to one. It's, 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 that's yes. dramatic. So what's, what's the role of the independent in, in, in this trend analysis? Well, certainly, um, independents uh, tend to be disproportionately college-educated. So uh, to the extent college-educated whites are becoming a more important part of the mix, we would sort of expect all else equal for that to be juicing up independent stances a little bit. But one thing I do want to emphasize here, and it's important, um, and something people politically, so, political science oriented are constantly fighting with people about, it's like independents aren't independent. Just because you register as an independent doesn't mean you're independent. Just because you say in a, in, a, in a poll, are you Republican, Democratic, independent? Oh, I'm an independent. You know, I don't, nobody tells me what to do. But uh, political scientists have found over and over again, if you follow up, that declaration that they're an independent with, well, do you lean more toward the Republicans or toward the Democrats? And most people will say, two-thirds or more of those independents will say which way they lean. And if they, the leaners act just like the, <laughs> the independents who lean Republican are really just like Republicans. Independents lean Democrats just like Democrats. They just don't want to say they're Democrats <laughs> or Republicans, you know, because it's uncool to be, you know, like, party and you know the bosses tell you what to do but in the end they pull the lever for the same people so you can't read too much into these these high independent figures they don't tell you as much as as people think they do uh, yeah real quick question with the uh, proliferation oh, sorry about that the proliferation the proliferation, the proliferation. The proliferation. The proliferation. <laughs> of immigrants from Mexico now, people think that they're mostly Democratic voters. Mm -hmm. Would that be different if they would move to a population that was more Republican as they assimilate into that population? Well, uh, we've looked at that, uh, that, or that's been looked at. We didn't look at it in the study. Um, it does make uh, some difference which part of the country they uh, go to. But, um, and for example, where in that uh, uh, and that if they, if, for example, if they settle in the outer suburbs, they tend to absorb a little bit of that political culture, be a little bit more conservative. I mean, on average, though, the distance between them uh, and the local population in terms of, say, their Democratic Party identification is still going to be huge. I mean, it's just, for example, uh, Hispanics who settle in Los Angeles are going to be a little bit different than Hispanics who settle in 
you know, Nebraska or something, but they're still going to be quite democratic and certainly very democratic relative to local population. So it's not like they settle in a Republican area, they're Republican. It's just like they're a little bit less democratic than they other, otherwise yeah. would be. Yeah, I mean, it's a common question. Do movers who move to a certain destination become like the people in the destination, or do they bring something with them? Right. You know, like all these Californians who moved here to Nevada, have they, have they changed things, or are they going to become more like Nevadans? And I, I mean, I, don't, I think the jury's kind of out on a lot of this, but uh, my feeling is they bring a lot with them. Uh, uh, their original ideas, and I think. And actually, we did look in this in the survey. You'll hear more about this later. At people who had uh, been in the area for a long time versus people who moved there relatively recently, and we do tend to find, particularly if they're from California or the ethnicity, they're, they're, they're tend to be more liberal than the counties in which they're they've located in, in some of these conservative areas. Rob, so we got time for one more. Oh, yeah. um, We have thought about maybe also doing the not college and, uh, and non college, and it, in terms of minority, and it, is there a, might there be a party distinction there? Uh, well, I mean, for the sake of simplicity, we, we didn't do that. I mean, you could do that. I'm not sure how much more it would tell you than what we have. I mean, basically, college educated, there's, if you look at Hispanics, the uh, difference in party identification between those who are college educated and those who are not college is not is not huge. I mean, there's more of a differentiation by income, but it's not like you get pretty far up the educational scale and Hispanics, you know, start shifting their party ID, you know, radically toward the Republicans. So um, their political behavior doesn't differ enough to probably, and you also a small group in some states. It's complicated. I mean, like. Like any group, uh, you know, it'd be nice to look at it in more detail, but then, you know, it's, it's like more work from other, and, you know, in some, some sense it could confuse the, uh, the simplicity of the patterns we're trying to look at. But you know what we always say when people ask us to do more? We say, yeah, we can do more research. Just, you know, <laughs> give us the resources. <laughs> if you have uh, other questions for, for the author or for the presenters here, you'll have time at the break. Um, you can corner them there. Um, so next up, we have. Uh, the metro politics of the Intermountain West here, and this will put uh, much more attention on what the battle in the suburbs here, and it's going to be presented by Rob Lang, the director of uh, Brookings and the Lindsay, and his colleague Tom Sanchez, who's professor and chair of urban and planning at Virginia Tech. New PowerPoint. I know it's morning. I know there's PowerPoints. I know I've got data in mind. I apologize up front for those bleary-eyed out there, especially the travelers from other parts of the country. You're not going to talk about that. I am. I'm, I'm loving. I'm all over Utah. Actually, you, you've given me a new uh, sort of thumbnail, Rui. Uh, I have the three Ds of politics, which I'll show, which, which is Democrats plus dense, uh, pardon me, density plus diversity equal Democrats. You've given me hippies and Hispanics equal Democrats. So that was your, uh, that was your tag. Is it on here? Oh, really? I have to do work? Wait a minute. Okay. Given my Luddite tendencies and utter lameness around technology, uh, Becky has graciously come down and bailed me out and uh, put the PowerPoint up. Uh, this is three of us, a grad student, Chrissy, back there, Tom, and me. And where is my little channel thing here? OK, I can do this. Uh, let's just start with the big issue and the big question. Uh, we're growing. And we have went from 200 million in 1967 to 300 million just a few years ago. And we're on track, according to the last round uh, of the census. They may have to adjust this, as uh, Bill knows. But uh, the 400 millionth American should be added by 2039, the start of that decade at least. Uh, this is a rate faster than any country except India and Pakistan, and actually it's uh, faster than China, where a lot of the growth is just simply a shift from uh, rural to urban location. That's why China's booming. Uh, and most of this gain, a big share of it, is in the biggest metros. And as I noted earlier, the uh, findings that Tom Sanchez and I had by analyzing the, uh, the uh, suburban vote from 2008, we went back to 2000, is that the density of a suburb, especially the urbanizing suburbs, places that were built out already, places where the housing 
In a lot of regions here, this would be different because this is such a new region. But the 50s, 60s subdivisions that were so dominant in the post-war years, those have mostly transitioned to democratic voting. And in fact, they're some of the largest space for new immigrants to come to. Uh, in this region, that's a right fine old neighborhood. And so some of the democratic areas here include a much newer housing stock, places that are just done growing here uh, inside the uh, 215, say, uh, tend to be, you know, especially the further north you go out of Henderson, and south you go out of North Las Vegas, uh, tend to be uh, democratic space. And also in 2008, the suburbs, and we did a lengthy analysis on this, and it appears in different places, ended up being the balance in the country for uh, the election, which is easy to say, which I'll show in a second, because you know, one in two Americans is a suburbanite. And it's really the issue is not the suburbs writ large when there's so much diversity in the suburbs. The more specific issue is what's the break point in the suburbs? Which type of suburbs? And what it comes down to is often that the older suburbs, even the maturing suburbs that aren't that old but just finished building and you know, maybe seeing some redevelopment but not much, those have been increasingly going to the Democrats in our sort of look at really back to 88 in some cases. Uh, you know, just to put it in context, anyone familiar with Marin County, California? How would you describe Marin? <laughs> Marin, even when I was a kid, Marin, you know, the first time I was in Marin County, I was a kid, my parents in San Francisco, and went over that bridge and I was like, my God, this is Shangri-La. Well, you know, for me, anyway. Well, I, I, as a kid, as a nerd, 1976, I'm 17, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the, the, the you know, election, and it's actually you know, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford. And I'm looking at the county results, and I see that Marin County went for Gerald Ford. And that is amazing to me. That's how different, one, the Republicans were, and two, the suburbs were in 1976. Uh, and the state I lived in, New Jersey, at that time went for Ger Gerald Ford. And it's not that reliably a Republican state anymore. And so a lot's changed. And when you t look at the numbers we're talking about of change going forward, we just keep churning and churning decade by decade. You're talking about 30 million added per decade. You're talking about over time an equivalent by the mid-century of adding the entire population of Germany, the largest European Union country, into the mix in the United States, mostly in its metropolitan areas, with a very large share of that going to not just suburbs, but we're not going to the periphery and we're not developing as much of the edge as we've done in the past. And so a larger share of that, which is mostly minority, gets patterned over the existing space and urbanizes those suburbs, creates a quasi-city out of them. And they actually exhibit a pattern of voting like a city itself, not quite like the core, but more so than the, older sub than the newer suburbs, rather. And so the share of the country in that demographic, the share of the country in that location, they are also sympathetic, by the way, on a whole host of metropolitan issues. They're sympathetic to transportation infrastructure investment, things that are gonna solve problems you know, in their life, uh, investment in schools and so on. And so this is a, you know, an important dynamic in itself. It's also important, important just, you know, not just in presidential politics, but important in terms of even state politics and investment in infrastructure. In state politics, the interesting thing, and I'll show you the data, <laughs> is that despite the size of a region like Las Vegas, or even Denver relative to the rest of the state, the metropolitan areas are weaklings politically in the state politics. They could deliver a senator to Washington and change the balance of power in the state. They could deliver an electoral vote to a Democratic presidential candidate. But when it comes to defending their interests, they tend to see their resources drift off to the hinterland, to the new heartland, to the old heartland, really. We're the new heartland. But the heartland that was identified in the slides you saw previously. And part of that is that the metros are still contested enough between the parties to where a Republican dominance in the rural areas and the voting of somebody like, in a region like this, there are Republican representatives that go to Carson City. And they vote more with party than place. And they, if you do the signature on what it looked like their focus of interest were in terms of directing resources around the state, you'd find that they really represented Winnemucca, not Henderson. And that's not just true of here. You see this everywhere. I saw this when I lived in Northern Virginia, which was my previous address. I saw, you know, you see this in Atlanta versus the rest of Georgia. You see this around the country. This is a pattern that's noticed by the Brookings Metro Center, Brookings Mountain West, and it's something that's interesting politically in a larger sense, something we want to address.
because it's one of the things that's reducing the number of tools that these globally connected places of these big metros have to enhance their own capacity to compete in the global economy. Now, I'm going to make you memorize this. So, no, I'm just putting this officially. There are things called metropolitan areas. In fact, they're changing the definitions. We're adding larger scale to these things. And also, there's something called the suburbs. Now, the interesting thing is you would think that the Census Bureau, given that one in two Americans lives there, might just think of giving you a definition of what is a suburb. No. Because as Bill knows, it's like six guys in a, in a gray room in Suitland, Maryland. And they say to us, you guys can't even figure out what that is. So don't ask us to do it. But what they will give you is this. They'll say there's this thing called metros. They'll say there's a thing now called a principal city. It's switched from a central city. And there is also something called a non-principal city. The metro share that's not in the principal cities, that's the suburbs. That's how it's treated in terms of the analysis. Also, because of the demands by firms like Applebee's and Walmart, they added the micropolitan areas. What they are are mini metros. Think Elko. Think Scotts Bluffs, Nebraska, places like that. In the east, these are fillers between big metro areas, the micros. But in the west, they are standalone kind of central market areas, places with good-sized regional hospitals in them. If you get medevaced and you're in the remote west, you might go to one of these places. Uh, and we have found, and I, in 2004, when I was at Virginia Tech, I did the first analysis of the micropolitan areas, because they were only invented in 2003. And in 2004, it's the first time you ever check on them. What I checked on them is that they helped deliver the state of Ohio, which was the balance of power in that election, to George W. Bush. And in fact, Kerry put all of his eggs in this basket. He said, I'm going to win Ohio, and that's going to be the key to unlock the sort of electoral safe to win victory. That's what Al Gore didn't do. And he went in there and he competed in about 17 of the state's 88 counties. He completely missed this category of micropolitan, which in some states matters. North Carolina's got a big share in it. Ohio's got a big, big share in it. And he missed that space. And if you look at the last few weeks that Bush was campaigning, it was like a tour of America's micropolitan areas. Karl Rove knew what they were immediately. I think he knew what they were prior to the census's designation of them. Uh, a lot of people did. As I say, Walmart built the whole business out of it. Uh, in terms of just how they vote, they're mostly Republican. In the Intermountain West, they're a little more complex. There's not many of them, and they tend to be uh, a kind of more contested space than in the rest of the country. Now, when we did this original analysis for the whole US, we used a, a county-based typology. In the East, if you look at a region like Atlanta, and it's 60 counties, or Washington, there's like 30 counties. There's one county here. We're in a county that's bigger than the state I grew up in. Right? In, in fact, when, when Rui showed the maps and said, this is blue, it's not that all of Clark County is blue. It's like a tiny little speck of Clark County that you could barely see on a map like that. If you went to the precinct level, which we've gone to, and Tom and I are getting the precinct data out of this next election, and that'll be the full analysis. But when you go to the precinct level, what you find is that the actual space the Democrats win is minuscule. If dirt voted, the Republicans have a lot for all time. But dirt don't vote, people vote. And people live in high density, and especially in this region. Now, we couldn't do the county typology for that reason. In other words, it's not relevant here. All of Clark fits into this you know, one space. It's like a big box, and everything shakes around inside of it. San Bernardino's that way, too. So we're going to go in and get to the precinct level, which we've done in the past in the Washington region, and drill down and find what's important is the breakpoints in a region. My suspicion is that somewhere in Henderson and Paradise is a kind of zone that if you don't win it and you're a Democrat, you lose the state. And if you win it and you win out to the 215, say, you end up winning the whole state as well. You don't have to win all that many square miles of Las Vegas or Reno to win the entire state. You could win something you could walk across practically in a day on a brisk walk, and you own the whole state, which is, of course, one of the largest states in the union. Now, the metropolitan areas are going to make most of the gains. The share that they gain will mostly go into built-up areas, depending on the region. Dallas will be more at the edge, but you know, LA and Miami, they're out of space anyway. If you want to grow Miami at this point, you have to add it back into the suburbs. And the uh, rural and exurban vote in the long haul. The, ex the edges of the suburbs and the rural vote cannot offset the Democratic gains if you look in the structural change going forward. This is even uh, a look at the uh, change in just the, elect uh, the popular vote, rather, from 1988 going back to the same year we did. The interesting thing here is that the Democrats, almost in a steady gain structurally, just pick up more and more and more each election. 
and the Republican vote is more volatile. And in fact, what's also interesting is if you look at the Electoral College, the, the perception in the media, I think the perception in a lot of people's minds is that the Republicans have a lock on the presidency. They seem to have been in the presidency most of my lifetime. When you think back really, when was the last time the Republicans just blew the Democrats out? Blew them out. It's actually 1988. Since 1988, the Democrats have won four of the five popular votes. They barely lost the electoral vote. And when Bush won the electoral vote, just one state, Ohio, had the strategy panned out for Kerry. That would have been the difference. So 1988, how long ago was that? How big, think in your head, how big would a cell phone be in 1988? <laughs> it would give you a backache. The internet was used by defense contractors to communicate specs to one another. It didn't, hadn't have any presence yet. So this is actually, in a lot of kids, you know, the most of the college kids around here's lifetime, they've never seen a smashing Republican victory. The Republicans can win again. Structurally, I think there's lower and lower probability of an actual Democratic blowout. They can put together the pieces, they can have an on year, maybe, the, maybe this economy keeps going by, badly. And maybe uh, there's, you know, the Democrats don't make a very compelling case. They don't seem to make them win in this election. And they win again. But in time, you know, over time, it looks like this is an eroding position. Uh, and the Democrats have made, in 06 especially, the kind of urbanized suburban gains that you see in, 88, in 2008, rather, that they just solidified and won the, uh, the U.S. as a whole. This is a map that's interesting. Uh, the USA Today, who I was working for, I was doing analysis of election data on that night in 2008. Well, People were getting a good night's rest. I was uh, staying up all night and uh, looking at election data. And they gave me this map. It was never published. And they hadn't even finished the Northwest's you know, data analysis at this point. But the reason I include it here is that, I guess this is the power, this is the uh, pen that works, right? Oh, hell, I can walk up to it, too. Look at all the blue. And then look at Arizona. I'm pointing it back at myself. <laughs> Use the force. Use the force. Look at, you can tell, guess who was running for president? You know, what state would that person have come from? In other words, Arizona would have likely gone in the same direction. Probably wasn't enough to win Arizona, but the Republicans would have been sweating Arizona big time. And it's Tucson Metro in particular, and parts of the denser parts of Phoenix, even though Phoenix is a whole, you know, the inside the 101 loop, you know, the center parts of Phoenix, those are sort of t contested turf now. This is also a 06 red and blue map, and you see each of these blue dots is the centers of metropolitan areas, and these are the metros. You can see how important it is, you know, in a place like Atlanta or Birmingham that you win that core. Phoenix's core was even in this case, and not, not necessarily blue. Uh, and quickly, just going through this, I know, again, there's data here, but I don't want you to focus on all that. Uh, what this really shows is at the bottom, there's about 20 million people currently living in the six states that we identify in the, as the Intermountain West. 17.8 million live in the metropolitan areas. The West is among the most urban space in the U.S. And even its urban areas are truly urban. They're not just metro counties around Atlanta that are really countrified cities. They are legitimately, at least at the subdivision level, small lot subdivision level at the very edges of the region, urban in that sense, dense in that sense. And that's true of Phoenix, and it's true of most especially Las Vegas. And what you see is that in some states like Arizona, for example, it's over 90% are in that share. And that there's tiny non-metro, non-micro, it's called non-core based population. In this state, only about 50,000 people live out outside anything that is identifiable as you know, a place you could get a regional airport in, a Reno, Las Vegas, but in, by extension, even an Elko. Uh, below that, there is just hardly anyone out there. Now, that's different. In other parts of the country, there is a significant rural population. Even New Mexico, as a share, has a sort of bigger about, amount of micropolitan areas, a bigger rural presence, less, less metro. And the southern Intermountain West is slightly differentiated in this regard than the northern Intermountain West, as you see there. But overall, the pattern continues through the whole space. Then you look at, well, what's the suburban share? This is the non-principal city share. 10 million. Makes sense. About one in two people in the Intermountain West are suburban dwellers. And it's the growingest part of that population. Uh, you're in, by the way, right now, what's considered principal city. You're not in Las Vegas. I hate to break it to you. 
Rui, you may never get to Las Vegas. Because the Strip is not in it, and if you don't go north of Sahara, you've never visited it. And you're in what, what we call, and we love to call, I'm going yeah, to count, I'm going to score at your favor, but we're in, we're in paradise. I'm soon to even be a resident of paradise. I just love the idea. I live in paradise. Uh, even paradise, which by and large doesn't look like an eastern city in, you know, in the sense of, I, you know, I don't see soaring, you know, paradise other than the Strip, it's, you know, which is really a hotel zone. You don't see this kind of, you know, massive high-rise construction. And so, you know, paradise gets there because the census, and it isn't even a real city, it's a census-designated place, it's not incorporated, no one knows what it is, only six guys in Suitland, Maryland, and the census could have figured this out. They say, hey dudes, you got enough business, you got enough population, you're actually a city. The reason I'm raising this is that even the city share of what's the inner mountain west is suspicious to me, and that most of it is by any visual inspection, suburban. And that really what it is is that there's a tiny little urban core in these regions, at like Lodo in Denver, say. But the, really the dynamic is older built places, newer built places that are urban. The older it is, the more diverse it is, the more likely it is to be democratic. The zone at which you can categorize that space has enlarged. The balance of power in the states are determined by the share captured of that vote. And in every election, you could almost guarantee. In Virginia, I, was, I had it down to where if you won out the northern part of the state west of Dulles Airport, you owned Virginia. If you were back to Reston or Tyson's Corner, you were through as a, Repo as a Democrat. If you, were, you know, if you were a Democrat, you had to win that much in Northern Virginia because there were all these downstate voters that would vote in the other direction. Same here. The same dynamic occurs. If you don't win out a certain core of this region, if Harry Reid doesn't win out a certain core of Las Vegas, then no matter what happens in the rest of the state, it's almost impossible to make up the numbers. So, you know, because you can't count on many places in White Pine or Lincoln County even as depleted as they are of population, they are virtually a lock in the other direction and energized in this particular room. Uh, the largest cities also are mostly suburban. Uh, again, Las Vegas paradise. With it just Las Vegas alone, you'd have a much larger share that was uh, suburban. And you look at Denver or, you know, the only really d outlier here is Albuquerque, which is the mayor, David Rusk of Albuquerque, wrote a book called Cities Without Suburbs, and he meant it. He annexed every suburb, and it's all part of Central City, Albuquerque. You could live in like, Jack Rabbit, New Mexico, and it's part of Albuquerque. You know, you, your subdivision could be overrun with wolves, and you're in Albuquerque. <laughs> so again, some of this is an artifact. The issue is really, what do we know at the precinct level? What are the densities? Uh, and we do know that from 04 to 08, a certain amount of counties flipped. In fact, actually, the, the kind of purple shaded he stuff here are the flippers. Reno flipped. Reno is now voting more like Las Vegas. Reno and Las Vegas together could determine any outcome within the state they chose to. However, the divide north and south, even metro to metro, in some states, and you see this around the country as well, you know, Kansas City versus St. Louis, you know, which side of Missouri are you on? Which, who, who are you for? That kind of divide still reduces the overall dominance of what would be overwhelming population weight in metros and reduces the amount that metros get as a share of their amount of state resource. And the flipper is just showing that the, a lot of these are actually the metropolitan counties more than the non-metro counties, meaning they're more volatile. Uh, and I want to wrap up quickly here uh, and just point out a few. Again, sorry for the density of these numbers. We've yet to translate this into the kind of cute graphics. I appreciate your graphics, by the way. They were very, thank God you started because a table like this would have sent everybody for the exits. Uh, well, you would. It's the kind of guy you are. All right, let's see if uh, I can master this at this point. Yeah. You see these percentage changes in the, the Republican turnout is what we looked at. And it was even with McCain on the ticket, they still lost some ground, the Republicans. But the big changes are places like Nevada and, and New Mexico and, interestingly, Utah. Salt Lake City, on its own, which is a substantial place, is a Democratic space. It has Matheson as the Democratic congressman out of there. Uh, the, you know, the, the spaces you see, the contested house seats that you see in this election, like uh, the seat uh, that Mitchell's in in Scottsdale and, uh, you know, the Perlmutter in the 7th District. In, uh, it's a district that wraps and is gerrymandered around Denver that goes from Lakewood, Colorado, all the way out to Aurora. Those kinds of spaces are the real swing points in every one of these states, and they indicate where the Electoral College would have gone. In other words, if you lose a bunch of these house seats, this is, you know, 
a sort of ominous sign for the Democrats. But again, every time you have an election, you resort the deck. 04 was a beautiful, brilliant election for the Republicans. 06, not so good. 08, even worse. 10, wonderful election for the Republicans, very likely based on the polling. 12, who knows? But here's the more important thing. Keep going out, keep adding this minority population, keep urbanizing these suburbs, and Texas is a swing state. Georgia is a swing state. If Georgia and Texas are swing states, the Republican Party is the Whig Party. It either has to recalibrate and redo itself or it goes out of business. It's going to have to outreach. And of course, Rove was. Karl Rove was outreaching to Hispanics. They knew better on that. This is just distribution. They did. Uh, you know, the current party leadership doesn't seem to get that point. Uh, you know, some of this is just so fixed and so probable and so certain in the way that, you know, that, let's say Bill Fry, one of the top demographers in the country is with us, could lay this out to you in the coldest and analytic way. And denial of this is a poor strategy for political relevance, quite frankly. And so some accommodation is going to have to be made within the Republican Party to that minority vote and to some of these issues, or that's it. By 2024, you know, the five people left in the Tea Party are going to be literally in a Tea Party, because that's how small it's going to be. And I'll, I'll just go through this again. These are the metro shares, and you, know, you see even in the MSAs that change, and it's even more dramatic in some cases. And then finally, I want to get to uh, really what would happen, and I'm gonna, these are the last couple of slides, and we'll go to Q&A. What if only micropolitan areas voted in uh, 08? Well, what you see is that the Republicans would have won. There are three states that the Republicans you know, lost that they had won previously in most elections. Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and were it not for McCain, I believe, Arizona would have the quality, much more of a swing state. And you see micropolitan vote, non-core based vote, you know, the people who are in deep rural counties, uh, reliably uh, Republican, except in the case of uh, New Mexico, where the micropolitans are mostly Hispanic and tend to be like mini cities in that way. That's what I was mentioning, that they are the different micropolitan areas from the rest of the country. Now, did the Metro vote tip the states to the Democrats in 08? Yeah, you bet it did, because look at the shares you're talking about, and then look at the percentages. Like, when you win 54% of 85 or 86% or 88%, you're going to win the whole state. Uh, we could bring out, break out, and we have, the data on just Metro Denver. Denver alone would deliver the state, and Rui mentioned that. In Nevada, of course, Las Vegas alone would deliver the state. And in New Mexico, you have a state that is by and large, probably moving away from the Republicans based on you know, its diversity. And so in, in some, what it, what it really represents is that three to four of the Intermountain West states are in play. They're structurally in play for the long haul. They're urban enough, they're dense enough, they're diverse enough to be considered at risk for the Republican Party. This is a dramatic turnaround where the, the Mountain West was as reliable as the Southeastern United States election after election. Uh, and what we think, what we see emerge is that there are really two great swing regions in the United States now. The Midwest remains a region that you have to win. The sets of issues that you have to talk about to win the Midwest, about urban decline, about industrial decline, they're different than the kinds of issues you're going to need to bring up to win the Mountain West. You're going to have to talk about energy and environment and immigration and a whole other set of issues. And what's important is that the country's issues, the bigger issues of the U.S., I believe tend to be more about what's happening in this region, meaning the Mountain West, than the Midwest itself. In other words, you know, and I, I use this, this example a lot, Peoria, if you'll recall the old expression, will it play in Peoria, it was a vaudeville term, it meant if you did a show and you did it in New York, could you take it out to the sticks and still get an audience? Or if you brought it out there, would they be offended by it because it would have too much New York sensibility? Well, Peoria, Illinois, is now smaller than Peoria, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And if you said to me, will it play in Peoria now, I would be more interested in the Peoria, Arizona as the example, because Peoria, Arizona, as a kind of new sunbelt suburb, probably captures the midpoint of the United States in a way better than it does, let's say, looking at just the old industrial you know, caterpillar plant in Peoria, Illinois. And so going forward, the next several decades cycle, this is not only a growing space, it's not only a contested space, but we in this region probably hold the key to the next several presidential elections and their outcomes. And that is why the Democrats, in their smart move, when they were making smart moves, went for Denver. And thank you. Right. 
Rob did a nice job getting us more back on our, our time, uh, time scale here. Um, yeah, a couple of points here. Clearly it's cliche for anybody who studies or analyzes elections to say it's going to be one in the suburbs and one in the suburbs, but I think this research project really helps us parse that out. And when I was working on the, my comments for this and I was reading one of their other book chapters on this project, they came up with this great sort of Carville line, right? It's the density stupid um, in the sense is that the different suburban contexts provide environments that the two parties' constituencies gravitate towards. And they sort of uh, spill, lay that out a little more um, definitively there. So what we're seeing here is consistent with what we've seen across the country here. It makes their analysis a little more difficult, as, as Rob alluded to, and said the bigger counties here make it the, the unit of analysis much more difficult to sort of parse out, and they're sort of working on that and not mind-numbing data collection there. Um, a couple of things, though, that make, I think, this region more difficult to sort of lump in with some of the, this, uh, what we see elsewhere in the country is here. You clearly have a transient population here without a lot of strong community roots here. And one of the things I always struck with when I first moved here about 11 years ago was that 5,000 people move into Las Vegas a month, but they don't tell you that 3,000 people move out. Um, so you have a continuing reshuffling of the population. Certainly that has slowed down with the economic downturn here. We also see, particularly in Nevada as well as Arizona and some other places here, this crushing economic downturn here that seems to have hit the exurbs the, the hardest, right? The last stuff built has the highest levels of foreclosures here, and we don't really know what's going to happen in those areas here. As, new, as the banks, do they ever decide to sell those properties? Who's going to move into those places there, and what are they going to be politically here? You also have here relatively weak political institutions, which makes it much more difficult to sort of sustain these patterns over time as compared to what we might see in the East and in the, in the Midwest here. Now, clearly, the Democrats have done well in this region in 06 and 08, essentially implementing the game plan they used in Missouri and doing it in Virginia here. In many cases, I think they exceeded expectations of what we might thought, what I might have thought uh, they would pick up here. Now, what are we going to see here in the short term here? Well, clearly 2010 looks like a favorable environment here for the GOP, and that in turn has sort of mobilized their base here, re-energized here. There's one thing we have to realize here is that we focus a lot of this on national elections here, but what's important here is that what happens at the top of the ticket is also going to affect state legislative races and the state house races here. And this is not insignificant given what's going to happen in 2011, most redistricting here and the Republican gains in 2010 are important here because it might help them to temporarily blunt some of these sort of broader demographic and structural changes here that appear to bode well for the for the Democrats here going forward here but that may be able to sort of uh, help them out at least in the middle part of, the, of this decade here um, so if you guys want to get back to the stage here we'll turn it over to Q&A we got about uh, five seven eight minutes before break time here Do you want to sit at the end there? Oh. Questions? Sir? How does the macroeconomic performance of the economy affect the red and blue mix between 88 and 08? Since Tom <laughs> sat there while I presented the whole talk, I believe this is his question. <laughs> You know, we've talked about this a lot, Rob, and you have a lot of great insights on it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I left those back in Virginia. <laughs> it's yours. I think, well, I don't know if I can answer that directly, but one of the interesting things I was thinking about when Rob had mentioned, uh, you know, the whole kind of the factor of density and how that affects uh, voter behavior, and I especially uh, relate this to my own personal experience recently, is... You know, these people that live in dense areas, that live in these metropolitan core areas, see the services that need to be provided. They see the infrastructure that needs to be maintained, built, invested in, maintained. Uh, they talk to a lot more neighbors that, you know, uh, are talking about the, the quality of the, of the schools, both the, uh, you know, the physical structure, uh, structures as well as the, uh, the instruction that's, that's given. So they have a different, you know, they have a different view of, hey, this stuff isn't just going to appear at a, you know, isn't going to fall from the sky. Somebody's got to, you know, somebody's got to pay for it. Versus people that live away from, you know, these dense places with, uh, you know, the dense uh, 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 infrastructure and, ser and, and service needs that, you know, that, that don't see the immediacy of it. And the reason why I mention that is my, my own personal experience recently is moving to a rural area where I'm on septic, I'm on, I'm on well water, um, I, can't, I can't even get cell service where, you know, where, where I live, and I found myself saying, 
hey, why do I need to pay for bus service for those people that live in the city? You know, and I'm a transit advocate, but it's like, whoa, whoa, I, you know, I have, to, I, have to, I have to kind of catch myself. But I can see where, you know, kind of that, that psychological, or those, those perspectives, um, you know, can, can in, influence the, uh, you know, the voting. And so uh, that doesn't answer your question, but, uh, um, but I, I, I guess I was relating it more towards, in terms of the voters, you know, what, you know, how are they affected by those ma macroeconomic uh, factors, uh, you know, on, on a personal level? I mean, a, a negative GDP seems yeah. to affect the Republican Democrat mix. A positive GDP seems to affect it too with the Reagan era. How do you see that going forward in 2012 if the current environment does not change? I'd say if you have, a, first off, you're, if you're in office and there's a bad economy, look out. Doesn't matter what party you're in. Just look at it. If you're the party that most people identify charged with the country right then, because you won the House, the Senate, and the, the presidency, and things don't turn around. And the problem is that the Democrats also made this mistake. They talked about the statistical change in the country. Like, we are technically in a recovery. And I say technically, because if you're out there living, you're not in recovery. And so when you, it's, nothing gets a person more upset than when you lecture them. And the Democrats are so desperate late in this cycle that I see you know, Joe Biden is like hectoring people. You know, darn you, don't you know what we've done for you? He doesn't have a Southern accent, I don't know why. <laughs> I, channeled, I channeled a Southerner right there, but I can't do Biden. If I could do Biden, I'd do it. I don't think anybody could, I don't think Biden could do Biden. But he's out there and he's saying, you know, look what we've done for you. And the typical voter right now is like, yeah, I'm not anything. And not only that, uh, you know, you can say that Wall Street's fine, I mean, it's so bad for the Democrats that really TARP wasn't theirs. Yet, when you ask in public opinion research, everybody thinks it was, you know, that Obama signed TARP. George Bush signed TARP. TARP was necessary, but you can't, in, in the sort of heat of an election, be in the party for TARP. I mean, TARP is so bad that there are Republican candidates that are moderate Republicans, like, you know, Thune from South, South Dakota. And these guys are looking at possibly not being contenders in the 2012 presidential cycle just because they went for what was the responsible thing to do at that moment. So it, it figures in, but there's one, one thing you really can do. You can also overplay your hand. And the risk that the Republicans have is playing a, you know, a hand where it looks like they're rooting for the end of civilization. And there's a little tinge to them right now, some of the candidates they've offered, some of the destructiveness of some of that view that they're kind of hinting at, we're, like we're hoping GDP goes down and unemployment goes up just so we can take power. You get that whiff on you and the voters smell that, you're in some trouble yourself. Yes, um, if I could broaden that question just a little bit because I, I get the point on the demographics, it makes great sense, but you know, as an academic and I'm sitting there, I'm hearing a lot of correlation. You know, things are moving along, not causation. And what I say is what he's looking for is have you thought about this basic underlying data that you've got that helps us to better understand how things are moving and how they might move in the future to start moving it out and adding some more variables such as voter intensity, such as what's going on with the economy, so that we can actually have, uh, and I'm not going to say because we're, so, we're talking social science, a completely predictive model but something that can actually point us in that direction. And I'm sure some have worked in that area, but have you given some thought to try? And, I think it would help us all quite a bit. I think one axiom you could add is that diversity counts more in a presidential year, perhaps, than in a midterm. And so the impact of the country's change could flip back and forth. And that voter intensity, and again, especially combined now with a, a downturn in the economy and the Democrats are the party in power. So it can, I think it can flip around based on those, on those variables. And no one, you know, will never advocate the idea that, you know, demographics equals destiny. There was a point in the early part of this last decade where Bush did wonderfully with Hispanics. And it looked like, you know, Hispanics were a conservative voting bloc that were pro uh, pro-life and very conservative on, you know, issues where you laid out family values and so on. And it's just that recent politics, in order to gain short-term advantage, the Republicans have just so pushed this, this part of the electorate to the margins 
that I don't know what the steps are to the recovery of that. And that's something that's structural, meaning things can go up, things can go down, but there's a certain part of the U.S. population, and it's not just people who've recently come to the country. One of the things that was interesting in the 06 cycle was when Allen, you know, who lost the Virginia Senate race, you know, Allen was on track to be one of the leading presidential contenders uh, in, in 88, and he lost when he mentioned the word makaka, which is Algerian as an insult, uh, and, you know, pointed at a kid, and I, I lived in Virginia at the time, that election. I, wherever there's a hot election, I seem to move to the state, by the way. <laughs> the Flying Dutchman of these hot elections with Reed right now. So I, I remember that in the Washington Post they had Makaka's parents, who were these upper middle class success story Asian parents. And they were talking like, you know, we actually thought we were sort of in this country, and we were just sort of voting our economic interests. But now that you mentioned Makaka, you know, we heard that. You take our kid who went to the Honors High School in Fairfax County, who's an honor student at University of Virginia, who's working, you know, in a campaign for the summer, that's got a camera, he's just, you know, trying to, trying to learn about politics, and you sit there and you harangue my son as the other. And that's what that was. This kid was called out in front of, in, in Hazard, Virginia, in deep Appalachian, Virginia. And that came back up to Fairfax County. And I think Fairfax County was a county up, up for grabs, in a sense, in that election, based on, you know, the economy wasn't in bad shape at that point. Allen was a fairly popular guy. He was from Fairfax County. And then he said that, and that's when he put himself on the wrong side of diversity. He didn't have to be an advocate for diversity. He didn't have to be an advocate for affirmative action. He just couldn't make another person the other and use that as a political wedge to gain white vote. White working class vote is not the future. There's the demographics. Other, other questions? Go ahead. So where's that break point that you're looking for? There, there's two key break points. One level is, and Tom mentioned this, if you're on city service, if you're in a place where you see that the city requires intense investment to carry on human activity, meaning you're in city water, you're on municipal sewer, you're, you're close enough to get a bus if you needed to get it, there's a thing called a walk score in urban planning where it can take every house in America and it can tell you, based on the services within proximity to that, how walkable that is. And I hope to get this to an actual walk score at some point because the walk score is a proxy for a set of variables where, as Tom mentioned, once you're beyond that service limit, you start to say, why do we need to invest in these enormous systems inside that service limit? You're a, an advocate for a politics very different. Maybe it doesn't change you, by the way, on things like abortion or religion, or some of the cultural issues. But I'll tell you where it changes you. Michael Barone, who's somebody we all know, I remember him giving a talk one time. And, you know, he's a city guy, and he uses Metro. And I remember him saying something like, well, we definitely need to fix the Metro. And as far as the rest of his politics, he's the kind of guy who's, you know, pretty happy with the way things are going in this election, just to give him a tag when I read his columns. And yet, when it came to something like fixing the Metro system in Washington, D.C., somebody who is a reliably, reliably a Republican on all these cultural macroeconomic issues, when you get right down to the meat and potatoes of fixing the city, they're all seem like Democrats. Or every mayor I've talked to of a booming, fast-growing suburb, when you talk to them, they sound like they've been drinking some Kool-Aid. You ever notice in the papers, they're all for transit. They're all for light rail. They're all for anything that improves the efficiency and the investment potential of a densely built environment. So the real first service limit is just, are you on city water? The second one is where you become absolutely Republican is if your house is attached, then you're in a high rise. If you lose the yards altogether and you're in multifamily, there's a transition point where most dwellers of denser housing tend to be Democrats, and that's even if they're white, they tend to be Democrats. And part of that is something that even marketers have noticed, that an affluent household that consumes a McMansion is different than an affluent household that consumes a high rise in terms of all these other sets of variables. And there, the Republican Party is culturally offensive, deeply and profoundly so, because of its anti-intellectualism and this sort of urbanite that's rich and might even want a tax increase, a tax decrease, will throw away a tax decrease just because of the sort of, because they're, they're sort of cos cosmopolites and they all will be offended by the Republicans' trajectory 
in that regard because it seems like, you know, they're, throw, they're called the urban elite. You know, they're called the, and so they're in that category. So one more question, maybe? Sure, one more. Robert? You can take this. Diversity, Adam, and what do you mean by diversity? What's your definition of diversity? Share of minority population. So more minority population is more diverse? Yes. It's a percentage. And we did, that was the highest correlation. Do you remember that, when we did that original analysis? Every increment out, it was, if you said to me, which is more powerful, density or diversity? Diversity. The combination of density and diversity is powerful, more so because it's synergistic in that even a share of the white vote. Also, denser located whites tend to be college educated. And the densest located whites, densest location, tend to have graduate credentials. If you take a white male and you send them through enough years of higher education, you have a minority voter. <laughs> Is that a fair enough appraisal for you? That's, that's, I was actually thinking that that's And the that's way Tom, to by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's actually the way to look at it. It's not, it's not the diversity or the density. It's really the, the synergy, as, as Rob mentioned. I, I don't think you can completely untangle those. I think we have a break for about 10 minutes, and then we're back in here for the next panels.